tonight we're having a, a, a public meeting, an open house type meeting to get additional input from the public on what would they like to see at Greenwood Park as well as uh, the Baton Rouge Zoo. Let's talk first about uh, Greenwood Park and uh, your vision for the possibilities that uh, exist out there. Yeah, well, we want to improve that park. It is the largest park in our inventory, 660 acres. We want to make it something that's good for the everyday user, and so we want to benefit the community that's surrounding it. But we also want to make it a regional attraction for the big day, for big events, and, and, and bring people from across town and even from out of town to come and visit the park. Hi, I'm Anna Course. I'm with Sasaki Associates, and we're here to talk about Greenwood Park. Our presentation tonight is in four different parts, starting with the first one here. So the last time we came out to the public, we asked them what they wanted for Greenwood Park. We didn't show any concepts or ideas, we just wanted to listen. We asked them what kind of program they liked, what was working, what wasn't, and then we took that back and really evaluated it. And we had a great response. Almost 700 people told us what they wanted for Greenwood Park. We then used that information to create four guiding principles that you'll see at the end over there. And those four guiding principles helped us define the three concepts for Greenwood Park. What are the four guiding principles? First is to celebrate Louisiana's nature. We heard over and over again how incredible this park is and it really has an opportunity to connect people to the nature of this area. The next is a park for the everyday and the big day, that this has to be a park for the community, but it also has to serve as a destination for larger events, for big festivals. It really needs to also open up and reach out, and this is about creating great physical connections to the park and out into the community. And the final one is to welcome and grow, and this is really putting the community at the heart of the park's design. There are three specific concepts for Greenwood Park, and we would like to walk you through each one of them, starting with this first one. EBR's heart. So in each of these concepts we took a very different approach to water, how we looked at programming, how we looked at circulation, and how we looked at ecology and nature and how that balances with program. In EBR's heart, this is all about celebrating food and music and culture of this area. So here we have an amphitheater, we've expanded the water to really embrace the natural site, and then we've also brought in some festival grounds and some urban gardenings. Our second concept is the braided bayou, and I'd like to walk you through that option right now. So the braided bayou is really about balancing the beautiful natural environment with a much more sports and active events. So in this concept, we have a sports complex. We've also enhanced and really naturalized the braided bayou, brought it back to its natural state, and that would be the cypress bayou moving through the site. So it's really about bringing people back and forth through the active events, whether it's basketball or soccer, and then taking them to the more quiet, intimate moments in the park, like fishing or just walking through trails and having more of a meditative experience. Our final concept is the eco-constellation. And in this concept, we really maximize nature. We really embraced the southern Louisiana landscape. And then we carved out areas to have more highly programmed places. So in this, we really want to create a moment of discovery, of awe and inspiration. We have aerial adventures in this one, kayaking, nature play. We also enhance the water system in this way to create blue trails and to really allow people to move through the park, not just on a walking path, but also through kayaking. And then finally, you'll see a lot of discovery and adventure in this option. Our final stop means it's your turn. So we're asking everyone to vote on these different concepts, but we don't want you to choose one concept. We want you to choose different elements with each concept. So did you like EBR's heart with the expanded water, or did you like the eco constellation where you could boat through the park? So we want to hear from you. And we have all of our surveys online, and they'll be open for the next three weeks for you to give us feedback. From your experience dealing with uh, zoos and parks uh, in other areas, uh, in other states, give us your uh, feeling regarding the potential that this offers in Baton Rouge. This park has incredible potential. To tie together the zoo and the park is absolutely amazing. And really what it allows us to do is to create this 660 acre park that really is about conservation. It's about bringing people together to understand nature, to understand animals, and really move through an incredible ecosystem. What is the trend in uh, golf usage uh, throughout uh, East Baton Rouge Parish, the state of Louisiana, and throughout the nation, and how does that factor into your decisions regarding Greenwood? 
Yes, yes. We know that golf nationally is, is sort of um, not growing as fast as some other sports are growing. Uh, that's the same here in Louisiana, the same here in Baton Rouge. You know, we did a study back in 2014 of all of our golf holes, and it concluded that we had that the supply was more than the demand and that we needed to make some changes. And so how that relates to what we're talking about today out at Greenwood Park, we have 27 holes out there and therefore, you know, part of what we're looking at is reducing the number of holes out at Greenwood Park. Well, this is a great uh, venue for pub public response or a master plan that we're presenting a preliminary version of the, not the renovation, but the reinvention of the Baton Rouge Zoo to make it a first class contemporary zoologic facility. Good. Tell us a little bit about what uh, some of your major changes are recommended for the Baton Rouge Zoo. Well, one of the biggest thoughts is to actually change the entry from where it is now on the southern side of the zoo to the northern part of the zoo. So your access won't be via Thomas Road, but more from Highway 19 or Scotlandville Highway. You'll actually enter the park, and there's another firm here tonight going through a public re review process as well with master planning for the overall park in which the zoo will be a major element. But the idea of entering off of Scotlandville Highway into the park, which is really a beautiful setting, and then having that the new entry to the zoo will create a whole new face to the community. And what other changes are you planning for the zoo? Well, it's going to go to uh, contemporary standards. Right now, the service of the zoo occurs in the same path as the zoo guests. Uh, so we'll have a whole new service uh, conduit. We have a primary path that takes you through the world, from Africa to South America, Asia. The Chafalaya Swamp will be a major local biome exhibit. So we're, it, it's going to be a whole new zoo. If you went to the zoo uh, once we're finished, you wouldn't recognize what you have had for the last 50 years to what this new modern zoo will be. We're excited to have a chance to work on this zoo. We've got about 40 years experience, about $1.5 billion in built projects throughout the uh, United States, Canada, and China uh, in the zoologic business. We, today we design exhibits as the globe functions, the interconnectedness of life on Earth. And like movies, we take these realms and interpret them in an engaging way that educates, entertains, and hopefully promotes conservation uh, and protects our living world. So every project we do, we know plays a part, not only in family values and attraction value, but uh, making conservation a really important part of everything we do. You know, you might find it interesting that uh, each year, more people go to zoos than all professional sports combined. So a zoo is a powerhouse. Uh, if a zoo doesn't perform, it's probably like this zoo, which was built 50 years ago and just hasn't been updated and uh, renovated accordingly. We're actually in the uh, sort of the tail end of the master plan process, having started it in uh, January, and we've gone through a series of uh, workshops and design efforts. We've had, this is the second major workshop, with the next one being July 30th, where we hope to take your input, as we took from the first uh, public meeting, and incorporate into a plan that's unique Baton Rouge. Uh, so within the park, and again, earlier this morning when we did the other public meeting, there's a lot of questions about, so what are you guys doing? We're doing the zoo. Uh, the Sasaki team is doing the park. But we're looking at it as a holistic project. So the improvements to Greenwood Park uh, that would actually have a wonderful impact to the region, the zoo is a function within that. But one of the big things that has come out of the initial uh, design effort is to move the entry to the zoo, to make it part of the park, to come off 19 rather than off Thomas Road. The existing zoo, is, it's, it's modest, but we have uh, responses that show that people who have been to the zoo didn't know there was a park. Been to the park, didn't know there was a zoo. So right off the bat, you know, location and entry sequence is a problem. Uh, although uh, they've done a great job with what they have, they haven't really... Uh, built enough new exhibits to make it contemporary in terms of functioning. Even to this day, service to all the animal exhibits goes through the same space as the guests. We, we, don't, we, don't, we haven't done that in years. It's just one of the things that this would be a great new direction for the zoo. Circulation, uh, the pattern is really uh, archaic. Uh, it went back to uh, the initial design. A lot of people today have to stop and ask where's the various exhibits, uh, how do you get back to the entry. Today we design in simple loop systems, so you really can't get lost. You go from a primary loop to then the secondary experiences within the exhibits themselves. We're within a complex waterway, uh, and we know that we've had, uh, specifically with this site, 
That's the hundred, blue is the 100 year flood elevation. The, the orangish red color is your 2016 experience. So we, you know, we've, we've had challenges. We'll be dealing with that stormwater management. Uh, discussions about how big is the zoo. It's about 149 acres total. There's 103 acres of zoo under fence. And the fence is an important issue. It, 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 the AZA, or the American Zoological Association, uh, requires security. For instance, the dog getting into a zoo in a few minutes could do hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. So the idea of maintaining security not only keeps the animals from getting out in the neighborhood, but from animals getting in. And it's a very, very important part. Of that 103 acres, there's really about a 59-acre zoo, which is a properly sized zoo for this region. But there's a definite relationship between gross and net. For instance, you need areas like off-holding and the kinds of activities for quarantine and so forth that make this 59 acres work. So that 103 acres is an important number. We'll go through this later, but this is the AZA uh, accreditation issues that uh, have to be remedied to get uh, accreditation back and resolved for the zoo. But the biggest idea is moving this entry into the park, into Greenwood Park, being part of the holistic redevelopment of the park, and really coming up with a much more dynamic and a dramatic entry sequence. How circulation works, it should be a series of you know, proper parking. Well, we need about 500 spaces of parking, proper entry complex, orientation plaza, and a primary loop that then leads to these secondary experiences. Each exhibit really is like a movie with a sort of a concept, a portal experience, a body of uh, entertainment experiences. You go through it with closure at the end, like a movie moves and has a positive response. You should have the thing, same thing with a great exhibit. Uh, Carbo went in and actually did a great job of analyzing uh, the tree cover and things that would steer the shapes of the exhibits. Uh, we looked at the utility system with CSRS, right now it actually has a combo system. That's one of the ACA issues as well, where that combo system is storm and sanitary. After a really big rain, the sanitary is overwhelmed and takes days to catch up. So by separating the system, which turned out to be more economical than we thought it would be, uh, we'll keep the existing sanitary system, which will serve you well for the next couple of decades. So from a preliminary plan where we got those elements in place to the actual final plan itself, which in its preliminary state, this is all the thinking that we've done over the last few months, we present to you today with uh, the hopes of getting your input and thoughts on it. But we have, and we'll, you see this is a blob because we're trying to coordinate with the Sasaki firm how the actual park will work coming off 19, but we need about 500 spaces here. Here's the entry plaza and building. Uh, orientation Plaza, which is a big splash pad as part of it. Adjacent is Discovery, so you've got contact, a lot of interactive and interpretive experiences. The primary loop, we've got the background of a, a big meadow for multi-use picnicking after our events. And then the two big lakes that exist now will be actually part of a great vista. You know, it's a, it's a sizable zoo, but you walk through the whole zoo and the, the, the depths of view is about the same throughout. So we'll, have, we'll open these big vistas, close them down in other areas. The great new exhibits like Africa will be a blockbuster experience where Asia was improved with a Realm of the Tiger. We'll finish Asia as a comprehensive exhibit. Uh, we have the Chafalaya Swamp, which will be up in this region. There's a small beginning here. This will really be uh, spectacular. And then South America. All the services that are up here, with the exception of the hospital quarantine and off exhibit holding and breeding, will come down to the old entry, and this will really be a service function. If you look through the, uh, some of the alternatives for Greenwood Park, you'll see that this portion becomes service for Greenwood Park is on a regional basis. This shows an acre grid and the impact of how this plan uh, deals with those uh, water uh, events. And we go right into the entry complex, which uh, one of the questions we'll have is, what should an entry complex look like that's appropriate to Baton Rouge? This is the one we did for Memphis. So the whole concept of linking modern Memphis to Memphis of the Antiquities, about 5,000 years. A person's taken through that experience, uh, and it's a dramatic entry that's celebrated through the seasons. There's the Nile that flows into the Mediterranean. It's a great, exciting thing. The problem with any kind of pool of water is that it requires lifeguards and the complexities and so forth. But it's fantastic in the day, looks elegant and wonderful, nighttime use. This is also about an acre in the size. It's the same size we're designing yours. A very different kind of architectural image would be the celebration of the maritime history uh, in the Victorian era of Norfolk, Virginia. So it's a traditional building, but it has the same principles of education uh, here, which would be on your left while exiting, 
on the gift shop is on the right while exiting and administrative function is all above with storage. Uh, we move in this case to a splash pad. It's a compass rose because, you know, a zoo entry is a portal from the local to the global biome. It's where we live and work each day and go to the world. It's big enough for celebrations. This is the Asia exhibit that we've done there being uh, foreground by the celebration of the Chinese New Year. Uh, Tampa that has a uh, similar kind of situation but day, uh, night lighting makes it engaging and environmentally uh, acceptable and fun. Is it neoclassic or is it modern? This happens to be the entry that uh, we did for uh, Zoo Atlanta. Uh, which radiates the future of the community, you know, really engaging. This, this one that happens to be in Evansville, Indiana. So, you know, what, what would be the, we'd, lo we'd love to get your feedback on what you think the image that you'd look at and go, well, that's the Baton Rouge there. We're doing one in Tucson, Arizona right now. I mean, it's sort of easy with stucco and beams and so forth because it, it's the desert, you know. So, but it has to have the fun and play of splash and engagement as well as linkage to the other resources of Greenwood Park. When we add the Discovery Center to it, an endangered species carousel, uh, larger and expanded contact areas as well as interpretive play, birthday rooms, or parties and events would be added. And if we go further, when we eventually add the reptile complex, that with the meadow, the entry to the zoo before you walk 300 feet, it's a mini zoo with incredible attraction value and opportunities for uh, engagement. So we'll leave what's sort of the barn that's been your contact area historically and go to a modern facility with classrooms and other kinds of interactive exhibits that will really provide hands-on activities and what we refer to in the zoo business as painless learning, the fun of learning about the world. Africa is going to be spectacular. Uh, it'll be one of the large African exhibits in, in the United States and really the, the greatest size Africa exhibit in the state of Louisiana. We come through a uh, small build, uh, building complex, a village with what we call rondavels. It's a kind of endemic architecture of Africa. From there you go past, uh, in the first one, this is the new giraffe building with a, a, a larger paddock. Red River Hog, inside the village itself might be meerkats and naked mole rats and weavers and all the really neat little details you'd go through as part of the experience. As we go further through the overall development, uh, you go through the, uh, the village itself then into the experience of the savanna. Because we always refer to Africa as the two Africas. There's a green Africa and a brown Africa. Uh, green being on the west with the rainforest, uh, the brown being the savanna. So we transition from the savanna, uh, this is a great shot inside of what a modern giraffe building looks like, to the forest as a total experience. Now we'll also have feeding opportunities for the giraffe and other kinds of activities that are hands-on and exciting for the, uh, the visitor. The big multi-species savanna exhibits uh, will make you feel like you're really there. I mean, very few people ever have the chance in life to truly go on safari. But you'll have a believable experience right here in Baton Rouge. Uh, this is Peoria, Illinois, that with their lodge and up-close uh, encounters like this, doubled attendance and tripled revenue. Our exhibits won't be quite this big. <laughs> But that, but that big rocky outcrop is what's called a copy. It, it's, a, it's a stone island in a sea of grass. And there's a great synergistic relationship between the critters that inhabit that area. But they include uh, pride of lions, a hyenas, a hyrax, a, and you know, all the other kinds of critters that uh, depend on this elevation. We've been asked a lot about elephants. Uh, we'll design this exhibit so that if that can ever happen in the future, we'll be able to accommodate it. But it's really, it's a 5% chance, I think, is what Phil talks about, of very, very difficult today. But we're going to build that flexibility in uh, should that uh, a potential occur. Uh, Baton Rouge, like New Orleans, is a really flat site. Uh, but we take these exhibits, this happens to be Cedillo Hills, and then it, the night building for the animals are here. You're actually up on the roof of the building and you're looking face to face to a pride of lions as though you're right there on the savannah in Sodilo Hills in Botswana. You know, there'll be other activities for after hours use, you know, where you have picnics or campouts or you know, different groups and scouts and so forth that'll utilize these spaces. I mean, it won't be quite that view, all right? But it'll be close enough to where it's a really exciting and engaging. And after hour experience in a zoo is really fantastic. It's, it's, it's magical. This with those upper reaches of the exhibits on top of the night buildings that you really don't know you're on a night building feel like 
really exciting. And then the Central African Pavilion. When you're on safari, these lodges are, are fantastic. It was filled with incredible you know, trees coming up to the deck, you know, fantastic views. Uh, and the, just the fact that they're great in the day and the night really ends up being a major attraction value. Uh, but we can create things like that here. So they have this kind of stuff right here in Baton Rouge, and it has a tremendous potential for after hour events. We'll make a fantastic new facility in the day as well as at night. This is Peoria again with a great lodge looking onto the multi species savanna exhibit. Uh, this is Fresno, California. So these things have radically changed the success by creating the attraction value and a true immersion experience within these exhibits. Th this is in Africa, but it's an exhibit that we did uh, up in Memphis uh, called Teton Trek, and we recreated the old Faithful Lodge. Uh, it's celebrated through the seasons. It has uh, the only three animals exhibited, grizzly, wolves, and elk, which, you know, grizzlies are really interesting. The other two are not blockbusters, but because of the environment, this thing has actually outperformed in terms of attraction value and attendance when we did giant pandas. Uh, so it's really a, a great thing. If you want to have an event there in this lodge on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, there's an 18-month wait list. So that's a zoo. That's what I'm saying. It's really an amazing thing when you look at it. So we transition from the uh, you know, grasslands to the forest, and it will find primates, including gorillas, for the first time here at the zoo. Uh, we have hippos with underwater viewing, as well as giant crocs sunning themselves on the banks of rivers where you can go face to face with this incredible critter. And there'll be the chance then to use these exhibits for after hour events and programs that really make them spectacular. Chafalaya uh, is a great exhibit, and a lot of times we refer to these as local biome exhibits. Uh, a lot of these end up outperforming even the big charismatic exhibits because it's it's your backyard ecology. It's where you live and work each day. And uh, it's presented in such a way that you can enjoy it. You know, the Chafalaya is really beautiful. It's a little harder to get to than you'd think, and just as hard to get back. So this is driving here, getting the experience, and maybe it opens the portal of knowledge to go ahead and expo explore the real thing. So we enter through a portal. We've got a, a black bear, a raccoon, a big alligator uh, exhibit here. This is the existing aquarium and the otter exhibit. So we. Add to that the big swamp house, and just like in the African pavilion, there's food service, air condition, you've got a chance to sit on the deck or enjoy the exhibit itself. Uh, as we move through the overall exhibit, it's, you've got a powerhouse exhibit at the back, which is uh, fish and reptiles, and finishing up past spoonbills, and then you look back over the gators, you exit. There's a whole concept that we call visitor pulsing to the way we design these exhibits. So where the restrooms are, where the food services are, it's all set up to maximize the day's visit and really create a great positive experience. In the old days, we designed great exhibits and expected you to stand in 100 degree heat at the handrail and enjoy it. So, you know, we were taking care of one animal, but not so much the animal on the other side of the rail. These exhibits will be a truly immersive experience. It's got a great beginning already with the exhibit you have. We'll simply add water and a place to eat and drink and have a, a really immersive experience. Uh, your airboat will be in the water now rather than uh, in the dirt. And we'll always interpret these exhibits fully. So, for instance, Humankind is interpreted no more nor less than the wildlife and wild lands showing adaptation that actually has to occur and continues to occur to this day. Asia is a great beginning with uh, the tiger exhibit in Siamang, but we'll finish it with tapir and sloth bear and otter and gibbon. As the Siamangs will actually put another primate in the uh, exhibit and do a huge Siamang exhibit where they're actually, they appear to be free. And, uh, if one of the elements we use it uh, from garden, the Chinese garden design is the zigzag bridge, uh, which uh, you know evil uh, in Chinese garden design glues in a straight line. So the zigzag bridge purifies. So whether you're coming through the existing entry or you're uh, coming through this net entry, all these loop systems work efficiently. In one way or another, you can leave, be purified as you go out. <laughs> so the existing entry, uh, really, it's a night, very very nice exhibit. But stuff like this, where we'll take this aviator for the Siamangs, and they'll actually have what's called an O-line or an overhead line. You see the, the Siamangs actually what's called brachiation. So they're flying through the canopy as they would in the wild. So all these would be really engaging experiences. This happens to be the one at uh, Disney. Really, really spectacular. 
Uh, there'll be places for music and events and after-hour parties as well as respite and uh, wonderful features during the day. A host of small aviaries and detailed exhibits. Uh, this is one that we're doing right now in, in Tucson, Arizona, an Asian complex that will have the same thing that we did with Mike the Tiger. You'll actually come face to face and have a, an exciting experience of being so close to such a big, beautiful critter. But the architecture is really a big part of uh, this. You know, this. The Asian structures are fantastic. We know a little bit about them from our Chinese restaurants, but really it's so much more broad and profound than that. And the garden design woven between the two it becomes destination facilities that even though you might have just driven 20 minutes from your home to the uh, Baton Rouge Zoo, you've been transported to global villages that are really fantastic. We'll explore their boreal realm with boardwalks and exhibits that feature the various uh, species, as well as culminations of primate exhibits that prove engaging and then that entry sequence, the exit sequence or entry, either one, goes across the existing lake and features the, the uh, zigzag bridge. South America will be one of the later exhibits and in it uh, we, there's actually the uh, water treatment plant that's about right here. We actually move it at that point and replumb to it to get a proper new exhibit with jaguar and night, uh, uh, nocturnal exhibits that would have 300 uh, fruit bats on the wing, a host of reptiles, uh, tamarins, birds, insects, uh, Patagonian cavi, screamers, flamingos, big waterfowl exhibit. And then we have a big habitat, uh, let me go back to that one. We've got a big habitat building at the rear of that. So this shows like the jaguar exhibit, a play area that kids can play like they're archeologists. Uh, nocturnal complexes, the cattle coal that's in uh, Palm Beach, giant ant eaters, uh, spider monkeys. I mean, it's a fantastic thing. If something we learned in one we just recently did, we had done a modest exhibit for small critters uh, as a sort of a Mayan run. Uh, but it was lackluster, so we just recently turned it into a play area, and it's now the hit of the zoo. I mean, it's been an incredible response of being able to touch, feel, grow. It's called adventure play today, but we're actually immersing them. You're in the Yucatan and a, a Mayan complex exploring and playing and having a wonderful time. This is also the cheapest way if you want to visit Mexico. <laughs> you know, you can actually have an evening event and party. It's really, really an engaging uh, experience. And there's more to come with that as we actually get into the detailed design. Culminating the whole experience would be a marketplace that shows the beauty and logic of conservation and sustainable practices. So that would also have a viewable from this marketplace with torches and really in, in immersive experiences for after hour events and, and, and parties. The reptile complex would be the last component of it. These things are big and powerful and fantastic. This is the one we just finished in uh, Zoo Atlanta. Uh, and we save it for last because it's really pricey and at that point you'll be successful enough to uh, afford it. But an immersive experience in one of these things is truly being in situ, being into the environment. So the new plan we think has a great balance. The elements of having proper parking and access within the park uh, working with the overall redevelopment of Greenwood Park is uh, very important, but this is a great experience of proper parking, entry sequence, the primary loop, Africa, Asia, Chafalaya, South America, reptile, breeding and uh, quarantine. The new train, or actually the existing train, will go within the, uh, it's right now, I don't know if you can see it from back there, but it actually goes outside of the zoo and back into the zoo. It's really sort of a security issue, so it'll all be within the zoo. Also, it's a great zoo ride, it, you know, but you don't really see any zoo animals. You will 50%, maybe almost 60% of the, uh, the train ride in this project will actually be going through exhibits. So be, not only is it a fantastic train ride, but it'll be immersed with the exhibit experience. So uh, we're really excited about it. We, we, this is just a quick overlay. So when you look through all the other plans of Greenwood Park, this is sort of us trying to figure out how all these pieces fit and balance. This happened to be one of the alternatives to the park. Uh, this is our edit, uh, AZA accreditation schedule, so by this, finishing the master plan, putting out a, a set of construction documents that meets all the requirements, building it. By uh, 21, we can then schedule the AZA for re-accreditation review, and by March of 22, uh, would be re-accredited which is a really important part because it's tough for Phil and Jim to get new animals from other zoos until they're uh, accredited again. This shows a master schedule of here's everything we just described. And so here we see the beginnings of phase uh, one, uh, I'm sorry, phase two, 
phase one would have been, uh, yeah, we'll show you this in a minute in a graphic, but this shows then Africa, design and construction, as well as the uh, Swamp House in Chafalaya. So as we finish up in 27, you'd have a major new zoo with these new exhibits. This shows Chafalaya being finished, and I think it finishes in 32, Joe? Yeah? 32. So what did we do? We've resolved circulation and flow. We've got a dramatic new entry with separated service from the visitor experience. Uh, phase one then is proper parking and linkage to all the new improvements that occur within Greenwood Park, entry, entry building and entry uh, orientation plaza, as well as half of the meadow, because some of these by phase and will still be operating exhibits. All these little red dots and di dash lines, all the th improvements that we'll do to meet the AZA accreditation requirements, but we'll also have, along with the giraffe barn, giraffe feeding. We'll have the, a hippo with underwater viewing and a slew of other improvements that'll add to the experience even as we go through phase one. Phase two is the big one. Uh, Africa gets realized as well as, you see we dig all the lagoons for Chafalaya and uh, actually build the uh, swamp house. So you've got food and restrooms and activities here, same thing in the African pavilion. So that's the aggregate of it as we move into phase three, which would finish uh, Chafalaya. And basically as an aggregate project, uh, we'll have created really one of the best new zoos in the United States and a regional resource. Now tell us about uh, your experience with other zoos across the country. Well, we've done, uh, like we said, 50 zoos uh, throughout the United States, Canada, and uh, a couple in China. But uh, notably, in local uh, markets, we did the Audubon Zoo over the last 30 years. So the last 30-something years, we did the Memphis Zoo, two very successful, comparable facilities, uh, as well as others in Florida and Texas and Washington, California, and so forth. But we're bringing that technology and knowledge that we've amassed over the last 40 years to benefit the Baton Rouge Zoo. What potential do you see in the Baton Rouge Zoo, and what do you see as the need for the renovations? Well, it's an old zoo. Ironically, it's a relatively young zoo. Some zoos we've worked on have, are greater than 100 years in age. But the, uh, it's an old zoo. It, it was built 50 years ago. Nothing's really changed except for a couple of small new exhibits. The, this, uh, this new plan will create a dramatic new swath of exhibits and engaging experiences. These things will become destinations, both day and night. There'll be a plethora of air-conditioned spaces that give our guests comfort, as well as state-of-the-art exhibits that give maximum comfort and proper animal management to everything within the zoo. Hello all, I'm Jill McCauley. As Ace introduced, uh, Schultz & Williams is involved on the business planning side of the facility master plan. And what I'm going to do is take you through a short presentation that really looks through the strategic business goals and the rationale behind the implementation schedule um, in an effort to make the zoo on a financially viable and sustainable course and really to leverage the asset as a cultural destination here in Baton Rouge. Um, um, just really quickly about Schultz and Williams, we have been involved with Baton Rouge for the past four years and know your area well. Um, we work with zoos and aquariums across the country and have worked with over a hundred of the AZA institutions, big and small, and bring that expertise to this equation. Um, as we look at this facility master plan, we really want to think through why the reasons we are doing what we do and how to leverage the guest experience, the earned revenue streams, the contributed support, and leveraging Breck's um, in, uh, impact. We have spent the past couple months doing a comprehensive SWOT analysis of the strengths and the weaknesses of the zoo. We have also looked at AZA best practices, Association of Zoos and Aquariums, and really what is uh, a first class zoo and how do we bring that here to Baton Rouge. We have also studied your own marketplace. What is the competition and what are the population trends, especially around tourism and population growth. As we look at the master plan, it is really important that we think about the people coming here to the zoo. And we have looked at the attendance trends of this institution, and really, the zoo had been on a solid track of around 225,000 visitors for the past 20 years. And as you can see, there's a couple big impacts on that. One of them was Hurricane Katrina, when there was a lot of 
people moving up to this area. Um, another was the Realm of the Tiger, um, a really great, one of the last big exhibits that has been opened up at the zoo. And as you can see in the past four years, there has been um, some impacts, and those have really been external impacts on what has happened to our visitation. And so we will be addressing those in the sequencing of our facility master plan. But those were the public debate about the zoo, it was the flood, and as well as other external factors in the community that were putting a negative spin on what was going on in Baton Rouge. We have also looked at the how the seasonality of this zoo needs to be a factor in, in the experiences that we're providing. You can see that it is not um, a northern zoo where July and August are the peak zoo going months. You all know what July and August look like here. Um, so um, we are really looking at how to best leverage the spring cooler but nice weather and the fall cooler but nice weather. But at the same time, how do we strengthen our summer experiences with water and indoor and so that it really is a year around destination. Yes. Most importantly, we are here to create a vision for a zoo that is uniquely Baton Rouge. A zoo that provides a great adventure that transforms what you have here to best serve this community and make it a cultural destination. Um, a zoo that is a delivering the core of a zoo's mission and that's around education and conservation and so all of the experiences are engaging people with the wildlife and the wild spaces and the story that we have to tell around conservation um, but and that is being done through engaging interactive immersive experiences where guests are up up close with animals interacting with staff even having the opportunity to interact with animals as we looked at the phase one, there were some really key must-haves to transform the zoo, but also to re-engage the community of the zoo in light of the external factors. First and foremost, AZA accreditation. And the reason that is important, Ace said, it is really around how the zoo works with the animals and the collection and strengthening that. It allows the staff the professional development as well as it helps the zoo be a part of the larger conservation story. But we know we need unique animal experiences that create reasons for us to visit. We want more animal experiences and we want to leverage what is going on in Greenwood Park um, as part of that opportunity. As we, we said, we're here to look at the financial case for this all. And really, if we're investing in this asset, we want to make sure that it's viable and sustainable for years to come. So we are looking at the opportunities to strengthen our earned revenue streams, strengthen the contributed support, both in the annual and the capital side, and again, leverage the BREC funding that we are receiving. We do see that the BREC funding will be the initial um, source of funds to make this happen and set the zoo on a track um, to achieve this full master plan. The master plan schedule, um, we really wanted to think through the sequence and just you can see here again it comes back to AZA accreditation because that's the core of the zoos, um, the animal the animal collection and our link to conservation. And then much is going on as you learned about with Greenwood and linking so it's one story between Greenwood Park and the zoo and that story of conservation will flow between the two but really also as people pull into Greenwood Park it just flows into the larger story on connecting the zoo. There's also a piece of the sequencing of the master plan that looks to leverage how the funding is going to occur and the timing of that, knowing that um, unless one of you wants to write one big check today, which any one of you can, um, that there is a, a sequence to this all and building momentum and addressing key pieces first. We do see the phase two work of Africa really being that dynamo piece that's that tipping point for the zoo into a larger attendance base, a larger attraction, really building the awareness and the presence here in the community. So just to reiterate what Ace said, here is the first phasing that leads us over the next 10 years a little bit further into 2032. So Ideally, spring 2022, entry complex opens and we have addressed those AZA accreditation needs. And that, and the AZA accreditation pieces do include new animal exhibits, including a really new uh, dynamic uh, pygmy hippo, hippo exhibit where you can see underwater viewing, really neat ways to engage with those. Um, 
colobus. colobus monkeys, so a new primate exhibit as well. And um, probably most excitingly, a uh, giraffe feeding. So if any of you have ever gotten the opportunity to feed a giraffe? Yes, so we know that it's fun. <laughs> so adding those new types of engagements and really allowing us those up-close experiences. Then from there, the Africa, um, as Ace described it, and the um, Aphitalia, I can't say it. Chafalaya. A Chafalaya Basin <laughs> um, <laughs> exhibit. Um, in the mix of that all, we see some, some other types of programmatic pieces to the equation. Um, as we look at the zoo, we are interested in having guests have a reason to stay longer. We're looking for reasons for guests to not just visit once a year, but multiple times a year, whether you're members or not. Ways to strengthen the zoo's brand and awareness in the community, leverage new partnerships, and ultimately fulfill that educational conservation mission. So one of those ways that we're seeing across country that's a really dynamic experience is a free flight bird show. Um, if you've been to Disney, they do this there. Um, but it's it, its ability to take birds throughout the zoo. They're not enclosed in any enclosure and they fly to destination to destination and even engage with the guests. And we'll create that wow piece without a large capital investment. As we talked about, giraffe feeding is in your near, near future, but looking at other types of behind the scenes experiences, going into the holding buildings, interacting with the keepers, seeing the animals in new different ways, um, and also allowing the exhibits to bring the animals into new viewing. So you're looking at them from the top, they're looking from the bottom, you're looking at from different sides. So really, how do we bring those animal encounters up close and personal? Play areas, um, as you can see here outside, play is fun, but it's also a really important piece of the zoo. So we want um, our families to have the ability to take the children and have play areas that are really integrated with the theming of the zoo, the story the zoo has to tell, and at the same time um, have the splash on that second piece of the equation. Splash is a really important piece for cooling off, um, but as well as creating a reason for families to visit multiple times and serve you on days where it's really hot. Um, we, we know us two-legged creatures, as uh, Ace talks, we would need to take care of the animals on the other side. We like to eat good foods. We like to dine in nice facilities and have really great experiences. So looking at the, the dining experience as being part of the zoo, as well as a reason to come to the zoo into the evening hours for events and private gatherings. Um, the zoo today has a strong safari night program. Perhaps some of your children have participated in the Boy Scout, Girl Scouts, or other types of youth overnights. Um, we really see an opportunity to expand this with some types of tent-type tent lodging that's thematic, that is immersive, connects the kids and the youth, and adults if you wish, um, into the experience of the zoo and taking them to a kind of foreign land that they may not experience. Conservation, again, is at the core of the zoo and is a really important piece of the zoo's story. So it, it, we look at ways to engage our guests in that conservation, learning about the different animals, even having the opportunity to support those different animals in conservation funding, Roundup for Conservation, different types of donation opportunities. Where we go from here is we're going to now take all of the discussions that we've had and think through attendance projections on operating models for the new facility uh, improvements, think through the funding, um, marketing, and really lay out a strong business plan to make the facility master plan a reality. Our role is to look at the new facility master plan and validate the business case behind these improvements. And so we have looked at this based on market analysis, industry best practices in zoos and aquariums, especially accredited AZA institutions, and regional trends in the population. So our message is that the business case behind these facility enhancements is the right thing for the zoo and puts it on a sustainable track forward. Give us an idea of where the zoo stands financially right now and what these uh, changes might mean. The zoo today it is financially sustainable, but what this will do is really allow the attendance to better serve the community and will have the significant attendance growth, um, which will leverage earned revenue streams. It will also create momentum on the contributed revenue and better leverage taxpayer support through BREC.
You work all around the country on zoos uh, in, in, in all 50 states. Give us your assessment of the potential that this offers. This would be a transformational uh, investment here in Baton Rouge. The zoo would really be able to uh, be on track to almost multiply its attendance from the 220 or so visit visitors that it had seen over its baseline um, to um, really over 300,000 visitors, if not pushing higher. You know, you usually build a zoo for yourself. Uh, it's about 75% of the attendance usually comes from the, uh, the local population. I mean, that region being a 50 mile uh, radius from the facility. So if you look at 100 miles in diameter, we think you draw from that. I believe the population base is around 800,000. Uh, so it, you have a tremendous potential. Historically, the, I think the, the biggest attendance year for the zoo ever was about 250 something thousand people. We think we'll get back to that as a result of the first wave of improvements and actually see that as time goes on. What would you like people to keep in mind about uh, the, uh, the, the potential that this offers and the, the work and the, the fundraising that's going to be necessary to pull it off? Well, all these ventures typically are uh, ultimately 50-50 of public uh, investment and private philanthropy. Uh, usually it always takes the public dollar to kick off first. Breck has committed uh, money to be able to make this thing really get started properly. But we think we're going to create a major destination for the entire region, used by families. Now, you know, it's an interesting note that uh, each year more people go to zoos than all professional sports combined. So a zoo is a powerhouse. This zoo is a sleeping giant and a, a properly sized community that we think we can make a spectacular destination. Very excited about the master plan. You know, you can't do anything without planning it first. So very excited about the planning. The big part of that is getting the community input. We ultimately want to deliver on what the community is requesting. And so as, as much input as we can get, it's going to help us have a successful project. What is the timeline uh, for this uh, project in terms of public input and then a final decision and then moving forward? Yeah, so tonight is our second public meeting. It should, uh, it's from 6 to 8 tonight. We'll have an online survey that's available for another three weeks. Uh, it'll have the same information we have here at the public meeting. We'll also be going around town in the next three weeks, meeting with various groups and getting their input as well. And so once we have that input, then we will begin finalizing the master plan, which we will present to the public, again, for additional input sometime in late July, early August. What is the website of Breck and the phone number so people can get more information. Yeah, so Breck, we're at www.breck.org. If you go there, you can find the survey there, and you can also call us at 225-272-9200.